Rock, paper, scissors. Check. How many of you guys played that game when you were young? Yeah? I play that game in college, sometimes for dinner, sometimes for drinks. Rock, paper, scissors is a zero-sum game, meaning that there's a winner and there's a loser, right? Someone has to pay for those drinks. And some people actually think that rock, paper, scissors is also a game of chance. I had an opportunity to work with IBM and Watson, our cognitive software, and that thinks, it learns, and it reasons, and it collects data. And so you can see up here our robot Marvin, who is playing rock, paper, scissors, and collecting information. Well, we learned some really interesting things from that game. First, did you know that men, 80% of the time, their first move for rock, paper, scissors is the rock? Force, power. And in fact, even though they vary that move from rock, sometimes to scissors, sometimes to paper, their predominant move, can you guess it? The rock, power. Women, on the other hand, 80% of the time, they start with scissors. And even though they vary, they really don't use the rock, that power and that force, until the very end of the game. So when a man will first play a woman, and he plays the rock, rock beats scissors. And even though we see that force coming out, we only see it coming out at the end. Now, rock, paper, scissors is just a game. But let's talk about a game that I love and we've been talking about today, which is the game of business. Do we see some of those same traits here? Well, at the end of the business game is buying. By 2020, 75% of all consumer purchase will be done by women. And that number is going up. Today, it's 50%. But think about the very beginning, when you create a company, when you design a product. What does it look like then? Well, only 14% today of founders and their management teams are women. 14%. And if you go to the very beginning, only 6% of venture capital and angel investors, where the funding comes from, are women. Now, I've had a lot of people say to me, well, Sandy, that's because women aren't great investors, or they're not great founders. So graduating from Duke University, studying computer science and math, I decided to go check out the numbers. And the studies actually don't show a performance gap. In fact, women founders are 15% more profitable than their male counterparts. So we don't have a performance gap, but what you do see is a funding gap. They're 40% less likely to get funded. Well, if this was a zero-sum game, like rock, paper, scissors, then you would say, well, that's okay, because, you know, it has to go somewhere. But what if the game of business wasn't a win-lose scenario, which I don't think it is. I think it can be expanded. What would be the impact of having women be forceful and powerful at the beginning of the business and in the middle? Well, I travel a lot. I've been to about 78 different countries. And in Africa, did you know that if women get five years of primary education to start businesses, that their children would live 40% longer? Win-win scenario. Let's go over to Egypt. Now, the government there did a study, and they found that if they have men and women working at equal rates at the beginning and in the middle, that their overall GDP would go up by 34%. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, we're not in Africa, Sandy. We're not in Egypt. What about here in the United States? What about here in North Carolina? Well, let me show you another story that I find very powerful. Connie Mester is the CEO and founder of a company called Thrive 47, founded right here in North Carolina. She has an angel investor, that's a woman. She is a woman founder, and she's got a very diverse team. Now, she spent many years in the healthcare industry, 
and found that there was a gap in women's health care. And even though women spend 80% of the health care spend, that that gap still existed. And so she founded a company and created an application for women by women, funded by women. Now, what does this application do? Well, it helps with anxiety and stress. Clearly, all of us speaking today needed that application. And it also helps to address um, mental health issues, other issues like depression that come about. Now, we have made some strides here, right? In fact, uh, this morning, I met with a fabulous group, Women in Tech from Cape Fear. There are a lot of groups that support women women in technology, women in channels, women in marketing, women in gaming, and they're all about bringing women in and providing them with some incredible support. And these groups are so very needed. I actually sit on the board of Girls in Tech and Women in Tech and work with Rashmi from Girls Who Code. These groups are crucial, and they've helped to move the needle. But it hasn't been enough. I mean, you can see it from the numbers. So we have to do something different. Now, the last speaker had a lot of quotes, and one of my very favorite comes from Albert Einstein. And it says, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. And so what can we do that's different, that supplements what we've already been doing? What could we do to change these numbers to have women more forceful and powerful in funding companies, in founding companies, and still we want that spending purse too. So let me propose a couple of ideas. And I'm going to start with one. And you're going to go, wow, that's kind of different. But I am going to suggest that we bring the men in. <laughs> now, I have a very uh, soft spot in my heart for what I call DODs, dads of daughters. How many in this audience are dads of daughters? Okay, you guys are awesome. Let me tell you why you guys are so awesome. If your daughter, if you encourage your daughter, those dads that encourage their daughters, their daughters are twice as likely to graduate from high school. And even if you're not a tech dad, your daughter will score higher in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Dads make a huge difference in a daughter's life. Now, my dad is here today, and he made an impact on my life. He told me I could do anything I wanted to do, be a mechanic, do computer science, do math, whatever it was. And it had an impact, his support and my mom's support. So what if, you special dads of daughters out there, all of you men out there, that we change the game? Now, if you think about circles of, of what we've been calling support, bringing women in, you know, from the early 1800s, these groups have been about women, right? Quilting bees, remember quilting circles? Um, you might even remember Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, and we started all the Lean In circles. I'm part of a couple of those, and those are fabulous. But back to doing something different. We've really never tried doing men and women co-creating, causing a cultural difference in this area, changing the game. And that's what I'd like to propose today, is changing the game and having men come in. So you thought you were just going to sit there today? All of you are going to get an assignment, especially those men, dads of daughters. So I run for IBM the largest and longest running, for 10 years, diversity group. And people from all companies come to me and they say, how did you do that? How did you get this group to last so long and be so effective? Well, the first thing we did is we adopted dads of daughters. And why is that? Well, think about any cause that's been out there. Think about any great marketing that's done. It's never done at an arm's length. It's always personal. So what dad out there would want their daughter to earn 50% of what their male counterpart does? Any hands? Or what dad would want their daughter's business not funded, even though she's more profitable? None. So let's make it personal. It's not just about women who work in your organizations. It's about your future for your, your daughters. So make it personal 
If you run a women's group, invite men in. And men, I want all of you to go out and advocate for this because it's not a win-lose game. It's a win-win, and we grow the pie together. Now, one of the things I'd like to propose that we do together is something I think is phenomenal, and it's a hackathon. How many of you guys know what a hackathon is? Okay, so about a third of the room. So a hackathon, I love hackathons. They're amazing. You get together, maybe 30 days, sometimes it's a couple of days, and you bring in designers and coders and thinkers and dreamers and marketeers, and you come up with great ideas for the future. So this group on the slide has come together, 13 women's group, multiple VCs, startups like Alpha Modus, who's here in the room, have come together to create a hackathon where we want women, dads of daughters, to come in and help us to create new things and to start a movement around changing women being more powerful in that founder and management structure. Now, the hackathon that we would like to propose is around a couple of different areas. Safety, healthcare, where women make 80% of the decisions, women's leadership, women's funding, global policy, even wearable IOTs. And we're going to come together and do this globally, five continents, virtual hackathon, also in-person hackathons, hopefully one here maybe at uh, Tech Mountain, that will really help us start this momentum and start the wave, the tidal wave of change with these numbers. Now, why is this important? Well, if we bring everyone together, companies and VCs are going to see this amazing talent that they can place in some of these great startups. Now, this is an interesting study. When a startup begins, they have 10 people, and three of them are women. When the startup grows and becomes big, the same percentage will apply to their new company. So 30% in the beginning, 30% when they grow up. So this hackathon can help get exposure, get that next generation, and help us to really change that area in the middle. There's one last area, though, that we also have to impact, and that's on the funding side. How do we get those great women entrepreneurs funded as well? Now, there are some gender-lend companies that focus on venture funds for women. Uh, you can see from the map, they're primarily on the West Coast in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, on the East Coast in New York City, and then we've got True Wealth sitting in Austin, Texas. There aren't enough of them. So down at South by Southwest, we got some big thinkers, men and women together, to say, what could we do to change this equation? And so even my coach here from UNCW said, you know what, Sandy, women are great at donating to charities. And these folks are all right. 64% of charitable donations today are done by women. As a percentage of salary, women give 94% more money than men do. Women know how to do this. They know how to see a cause and support it and change the world. So what if we could expand that from just charities to also venture funding, angel funding? Why is this so important? Well, if we have a woman VC or a woman angel, they're three times as likely to fund a woman founder as anybody else. So this could totally change the tide. So funds like Portfolio has done like rising tide, what are called learn and invest funds, where the buy-in level is lower, and you could have more women come in and learn to invest. They send out monthly newsletters teaching you about the companies that you're investing in, helping you to understand some of the metrics and the ratios, understand the products to really change the tide. In fact, my daughter, I was showing her this, and she said, Mom, if I put in half the money, will you put in the other half, and I can be an angel. And that's what I want to hear from around the world. More women, more girls who want to start in that early phase. So I'm going to end where I began, with rock, paper, scissors. I want every man in here to become a, an ally of women and help change the game. Because it is a win-win game, a win-win scenario, not win-lose. 
I want all of you guys to join the hackathons that are out there. Grow the pool of resource and talent. Participate. Take action. Don't just sit like we heard Nenifer do. Get up and do a walkabout and attend a hackathon. And then with the scissors that I know all of us women love to do, let's cut through the red tape of that funding model. And let's see if we can get more learn and fund models out there. Now, when I went to Duke University and I was sitting in my computer science class, 30% of the room were women. And I dreamed of the day that my daughter would go to school and it would be 50-50 in the classroom. But that number's declined. It's now 12%, not 30. So these actions, starting a movement together today, right here at this TEDx talk, whether you're sitting in the room or listening via video, can have an impact not just on today's generation, but on the next generation to come as well. Oh, and one more thing. If you're playing a man in rock, paper, scissors, go for the paper. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>